Okay. Good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to present here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the calculation of the renormalization group equations in the standard model effective field theory when extended with an axion-like particle. This is based on a, a recently published work in collaboration with Mikhail Chala, Maria Hens, and Rosa Santiago. So the, the standard model effective field theory has been extensively studied in the, in the recent past. However, if there exists new degrees of freedom at or below the electric scale, then we need to extend the SMEF to include the new operators with these new degrees of freedom. And one of the most motivated particles to consider are axion-like particles, which we will define as singlets of the standard model gauge groups, which are pseudoscalar. So these are very well theoretically and phenomenologically motivated, namely by the axiom itself, which serves to, to solve the, the strong CP problem, but also by composite Higgs models in which in the same way as the Higgs arises as a, a, pseudo, a pseudo Golson of a spontaneously broken symmetry, so can other, other pseudo scalars arise for certain symmetry breaking patterns. Also, in uh, certain dark matter models, the pseudoscalar is used as a, a mediator between the dark sector and the standard model. And the ALPs have also been uh, proposed as solutions to the anomalies, for instance, for the G minus two of the muon. So given these uh, very different motivations, the experimental effort to search for these particles probes very different masses. And more importantly, these experiments take place at very different energy scales. For instance, we can see here in the plot that for heavier Alps, the, the best bounds come from colliders at a center of mass energy of 13 TeV, whereas lighter uh, Alps are mostly constrained by cosmology or astrophysical probes. In this paper, we actually use one uh, experimental bound from the anomalous cooling of red giants, which is to, it takes place at the KeV scale. So we see that we have a very different range of energies in our bounds, and so to in correctly interpret them in terms of a UV completion of UV couplings, it's important to know how these Wilson coefficients run and mix among themselves, which falls from the renormalization group equations, which is what we want to calculate. So to do this, we need first to construct the, the new operators with the Alps. We're going to go up to dimension five. And so we'll, we'll also assume left a number conservation, so we won't have uh, SMEFT. Uh, operators, and we'll also assume that the new physics is going to be CP even. So this is a radiatively stable choice up to, to, up to the CP uh, phase of the Yukawas that we will uh, neglect. This is the basis that we consider. On the left, we get the non-redundant operators, and on the right, the redundant ones. Uh, that, we're, as usual, we're going to relate to the non-redundant basis through the equations of motions. As, as Arsene also said in his presentation, we also show the, the results, uh, the, the matching of the divergences in terms of the redundant operators so that it can be easier to extend this work to higher dimensions or to new uh, degrees of freedom. So here in the non-redundant basis, we see that we have three Yukawa-like operators and three operators coupling the up to gauge bosons. These operators are all Hermitian. So the Yukawa-like operators will be followed by three by three real matrices in the Fourier space, whereas this would come with a, a real coefficient. These are just the CP even operators, as I mentioned before, and the, each of them will have a CP odd counterpart with a similar uh, structure. This is not the basis that is commonly used in the literature. Usually, uh, in the literature, one the, the basis that is used uh, is one in which shift symmetry of the of ALP is explicit. And so the operators take a derivative in the in the ALP, as we see here, where Psi goes over the Carroll multiplets. And, and these shift Psi uh, are Hermitian uh, matrices. So we can compare now the two, the, two, the two bases by looking, for instance, at the leptin sector. And we see that in the shift symmetric uh, basis, we get two Hermitian matrices, one from the left hand and the other from the right hand, the left hand, and so we get nine plus nine independent parameters. While looking at the Yukawa-like basis that I presented before, we get a, a three by three real matrix coming from the, the Yukawa-like operator that I showed, and also from the CPR counterpart, which I denote here with this tilde, another three by three real matrix. So we also have 18 parameters in the Yukawa-like basis. So it seems that everything is okay. 
However, by definition, the shift symmetric uh, basis only describes shift symmetric operators. Whereas the Yukawa light, so the Yukawa light would seem that it is more minimal. It might seem strange that the Yukawa light basis can also reproduce uh, shift symmetry, but we show in the paper that uh, performing the appropriate chiral rotations, we can get the necessary conditions under which, under which shift symmetry is preserved. And we show here the, the conditions for the couplings here, the CP even coupling of the Yukawa like, the Yukawa -like operator and for the CP odd uh, coupling. Here, H are arbitrary emission matrices. So now that we're in the same footing, we're both, uh, both bases describing uh, shift symmetric operators, we can do again the parameter counting. And if we go to the limit of one lepton family, we see that this Yukawa like basis, so this limit of one lepton family can arise if the op only couples to one, to one lepton. And we see that here we would not have a CP odd, uh, a CP odd coupling because we will not have an imaginary part of a one by one emission matrix. And uh, so we will only get one parameter for the, from the CP even operator. Whereas in the shift symmetric case, we still get one parameter from both the, the right handed and the left handed uh, matrix. So there is some redundancy here. And indeed we show in our, in our paper, the relation between these two parameters in general and in this limiting case. So now that the basis is uh, taken care of, we can then go ahead and compute the, the divergences that are generated at one loop. We'll calculate it with the insertions of one uh, dimension five operators. So we're going to order one over lambda in our calculations. Let me just show you one example. And here, uh, looking at the process uh, of S going to phi phi dagger in which phi is the, the Higgs doublet. Uh, we see here the diagrams that generate this divergence at one loop with one insertion of a dimension five operator here described by these uh, gray uh, vertices. So this is the, the divergent amplitude and we will then so uh, absorb this divergence with our EFT uh, operators. And in this case, this divergence is, is uh, absorbed by a redundant operator, this RS5 box. And so we need to use the equations of motion to turn it into contributions to the non redundant basis. And in this case, we're going to get contributions to the Yukawa-like operators. Uh, by looking at these diagrams, you can also see the mixing effect. So for instance, if we look at the process S5 diagram going to the left-handed quark and to the right-handed uh, up anti-quark, this is a, a divergence to this process would be absorbed by the Yukawa-like up operator. However, we can generate it with insertions of, uh, oops, sorry, with insertions of different uh, dimension five operators, as we see here with the insertions of the Yukawa like down operators or the couplings to cage bosons. So in principle, we can have a situation in which this coupling is zero, but can be generated by the insertion of different, uh, can be generated through the running uh, through the insertions of different operators. So after calculating all this divergence, the divergent part of our Lagrangian will look like this, in which we'll factor factoring out here the dimension five couplings by which we find by A. And this C matrix only gets dimension four couplings. Here, the off-diagonal terms correspond to the mixing uh, terms that we saw before. So we can construct our beta function and after factoring out dimension five couplings, we get the anomalous dimension matrix which is constructed with the C matrix that I mentioned before and the wave function normalization of the, the fields that construct the, the operator in question. So at last we showed the, the, the anomalous dimension matrix. This is a, a simplified version in which the, the Yukawas are diagonal. That's why they only take one index. And if we look first at the upper part in which we, we have the beta functions of the Yukawa-like couplings, we see that we get contributions from all operators so basically we have the, have the maximum mixing. Uh, and indeed, due to these terms here in which we have uh, the, the row, uh, some, some of our flavors, we get the intergenerational mixing. Now, if we look at uh, the bottom part, the situation is quite different. Uh, and the, this, uh, the left-hand part, we could have set to zero a priori by non-normalization theorems. Whereas the, the right-handed part is a, a diagonal matrix, which we could, which uh, means that these uh, these couplings run only proportionally to themselves. Uh, in the literature, it's common to factor out uh, a gauge coupling in the definition of this Wilson coefficient. 
because this, this running terms that we get here come from the running of these uh, gauge couplings. And so by factoring them out, we can say that this Wilson coefficient is scale invariant. Okay, so now that we know the, the running in the, in the SMAC plus ALT theory, we're also interested in, in knowing this, the, the normalization group equations in the, below the electric scale, because as we, saw, as we said, for some of the experimental bounds come at very low energies, much lower than the electric scale. So to do this, we're going to write the most general left plus ALP theory. So the left is the low energy effective field theory. So after integrating out the W, the Z, the Higgs and the top quark. And by most general, I mean that we're going to consider all possible uh, operators that we can construct regardless of the, the UV completion. So regardless of what exists above the electric scale. And only then, only after calculating this, this RGEs, will we match the, uh, at the electric scale to the SMEFT plus ALP, so the theory that we've been studying so far, to get this, uh, to, so we do this three level matching to get the values of the couplings at, this, uh, at the electric scale. The, in this reference here, the, this is the, they do the one loop matching. However, they only renormalize this, the couplings that are generated by the, the SMEF plus ALP, whereas we do it in the most general case. And we, we show some interesting results when you consider the full uh, possible operators, namely the inclusion of the standard model dipole operators. Then as we pass by the fermion mass uh, thresholds, we're also going to integrate them, integrate these fermions out. Okay, so this is the, um, these are the operators that we consider and we see that uh, we have some couplings of the ALP with fermions at dimension four. We'll use the C to describe the, the couplings of dimension four operators and A for the dimension five uh, operators, for couplings for dimension five operators. Uh, now in the left, we also have dimension five operators which are constructed only with standard model, which are these dipole operators that I mentioned before. And then we also have this dimension five operators of the axiom and fermion. Now in the left, given that the fermions will also have masses, we can also have uh, dimension five operators renormalizing lower dimensional operators. As we see here, this is the beta function of the dimension four operator coupling the ALP and fermions, the, the electrons in this case. And we see that we get contributions from dimension five insertions, all, always followed by insertion of, the, of mass. Here we also have that the coupling to gauge bosons no longer runs only proportionally to itself due to the presence of the, the dipole operators. We also have here the, some part that is uh, proportional to the number of fermions in the theory. And this is a result of integrating out uh, the fermions as we go down in energy. So then we can uh, match uh, the, the left to the SMEF plus ALP. And we see that we do not generate all the couplings that we've been talking about. Uh, for instance, if we, at three level, one could think that we would generate S squared to psi psi bar, but it is higher order in the, the, the low energy power accounting. So that is now the, the electric scale. But let me stress that uh, different completions, so I was considering, for instance, a heavy scalar. So different completions above the electric scale could in principle generate uh, all these couplings. So now that we know the, the full running of our, of our theory, then we can see how we can use it to, to get new constraints on models and compare them with direct constraints. And to do so, we're going to use the photophobic ALP as an example, which is a model in which the ALP couples doesn't couple, doesn't couple to the photons nor fermions. So the best direct constraints come from monoz uh, searches which at the LHC high lumi phase would give a, a bound of, uh, of around 0 0.04, the inverse of the TV. However, as we saw before, even if the coupling to electrons is zero at the UV, we can generate it through these uh, couplings to the, to the Z that, we, that are non-zero in the UV through this running here. And the coupling to the of, up to electron is very constrained namely through the anomalous red giant cooling, which is at the KV uh, scale. So to translate this bound into a bound on, the, on our UV coupling to the Z, what we need to do is see which sort of coupling in the UV, which will, for this uh, particular case, will set the UV to be at 10 TV. So we will see which bound, which value of the coupling to the Z boson at the, 
at UV will generate the coupling of the, to the electron at the key EV scale, always matching at the electroweak and at the fermions masses. And what we see is that we get a result that is four orders of magnitude better than their direct constraint. Obviously, this must be taken uh, with a grain of salt because this is an indirect bound and it makes assumptions on the underlying model. So it will never substitute the, the direct bounds. However, it can help us get much stronger uh, constraints for specific uh, UV completions uh, for the alpha. We also do the same thing for the case of a top fill cup. So in the case that uh, we only generate at, uh, in the UV a coupling to the top part. But as, a, as, a, as we saw, due to that intergenerational mixing, we, all, we also have uh, the generation of the coupling to electrons through, through running. And so again, we can use the, the bound for the anomalous cooling of red giants. And we see that we get a bound on the, this coupling to the top part, which is again, much better than the, the bounds that we found in, in the literature. So in conclusion, given this wide difference in in energy scales at which the, the experimental bounds are taken to, to constrain all theories, it's important to consider the, the, normal, the renormalization group equations to correctly interpret these bounds in terms of a specific UV completion. Namely, the mixing effects can allow us to probe specific couplings, which would otherwise be very difficult uh, to constrain. Then, given that uh, some experiments uh, take place at very low energies, the running in the left can also be important, but it will always be dependent on which sort of uh, matching do we get at the electric scale. Thank you.